And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for this epic debate as we are very excited because we have with us tonight two experienced debaters and they are debating one of the classic questions of the origins of humanity, even the origins of the animal kingdom. So it's going to be a fun one. Want to let you know though, if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we've got a lot more debates coming up that we are very excited about. This Friday, we are stoked. I got to mention to you, this Friday, we're going to have a Flat Earth debate. I am not joking, though. I had a big announcement. I just let it out on Twitter earlier today. Wotan, who's, if you haven't met him, if you haven't seen him on the show before, Wotan is a Flat Earth debater, and he's a popular one. He's a big one. He's got a lot of attitude. He's one of those New Yorkers. He's from New York. He actually emailed me today, though. He's, he's actually not debating anymore, at least for a long time. He said during the uh, pandemic he's like nope uh not for a while so we hope he's doing well we miss you wotan but just so you know folks sorry that we won't actually get to have that debate this friday we will have an epic flat earth debate though we have new flat earthers and flat earth skeptics that are coming to the channel so we're excited for that and want to let you know though both of our speakers who are here today i have put their links in the description so that way if you are like hmm I like that. I want to hear more of him. Well, you can if you click those links that I put down there just for you. And want to let you know, it's going to be a kind of flexible five-minute opening statement from each side, followed by open discussion and then Q&A. So if you have a question for the Q&A, fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with an at modern day debate, it makes it a little bit easier for me to not miss it. And Super Chat is also an option where you can ask a question. It'll go to the top of the list for the Q&A. And it'll also give you a chance to ask a question, to taunt, or to give a rude comment toward one of the speakers to which they would, of course, get to respond to. We ask you to be your friendly selves for both the questions or rude comments. So with that, very excited, folks. What I'm going to do is, I forgive me, guys. Who's it going first? Can you remind me? Gotcha. Standing for truth. That'll give me a chance to look up what L.A. stands for. That's right. <laughs> Limited ancestry, baby. So very excited. I'll give you a hint in the opening. <laughs> OK, let me know what we're debating tonight. Like I said, I've been very busy, but uh, let's do this. I'm ready. Floor is all yours, Standing. Awesome. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for doing this. Mark, thanks for um, doing this debate with me. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to set my timer here five minutes starting now. OK, so uh, we are here tonight to discuss the topic of ancestry. So L.A. stands for limited ancestry. We're going to discuss the origin of species. Do the species we see today descend from ancestors that were divinely created, as the Bible would tell us? Do all humans today descend from just two people, Adam and Eve? Or do we share ancestry with apes, monkeys, dogs, and banana plants? Well, right off the bat, I can easily prove that limited ancestry exists. The genetic structure in humans today speaks to us of a literal Adam and Eve. The evidence for a literal Adam and Eve and limited ancestry is you and me, Mark, and even James, the awesome moderator of tonight's debate. What Mark should be asking himself is this. What would we honestly expect if Adam and Eve were true? I think it should be obvious to anybody that we should be expecting evidence for one female ancestor of all people on the planet, as well as evidence for one male ancestor of all people on the planet. Genet genetic data confirms these expectations. For example, in our DNA, we have a piece of DNA that we only get from our fathers if we are a male. This is called our Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is passed on unbroken from father to son. From time to time, a mistake happens. And every time this happens, a new branch in the family tree is produced. If we simply look at all the branches in the world, they go back to a single person. And this single person is not a chimpanzee. Sorry, Mark. It's a man. This is a man who lived just a few thousand 
years ago. This is why chromosome atom. We can do the exact same thing with mitochondrial DNA, which takes us right back to one female ancestor, mitochondrial Eve. Now in this discussion, we can look at many lines of evidence that suggest a limited ancestry. For example, we can look to orphan genes. I want Mark to explain empirically the existence of orphan genes in this discussion. Functional endogenous retroviruses. Mark seems to think that ERVs are the number one or if one of the best evidence for universal common descent. So we can always start with that one if you'd like. Functional ALUs, the overturning of junk DNA, the overturning of the so-called chromosome two fusion and pseudogenes, the existence of incomplete lineage sorting, linkage blocks, mutation accumulation, Y chromosome DNA, including the incredible dissimilarity between chimp and human Y chromosome DNA, and of course, mitochondrial DNA. These lines of evidence and more not only demonstrate limited ancestry, but also destroy evolutionism. I say we should go where the evidence leads us. The question of the night should be what directly records a species ancestry? The answer is DNA. Sperm and egg don't pass on a fossil or a bone. They don't pass on geography or a rock. They pass on genetics and traits. And so if we want to find out the history of humanity and the origin of species, this is where we must look. We have clocks in our DNA that go back just 6,000 years ago to Adam and Eve. There are lines of evidence that can differentiate between the two models, universal ancestry and limited ancestry. These lines of evidence can be found in genetics, as I just pointed out. The evidence that evolutionists typically use are no help to universal ancestry because both models can account for the data. The origin of species and the topic of ancestry is a question as to the origin of traits and the origin of traits are encoded by genetics, of course. Classic textbook examples of universal ancestry include homology, you know, the shared structures seen in the biological world, shared forelimb structure, for example. But we know human engineers design in homologous patterns. Vehicles from Asia, North America and Germany all build cars with headlights in the front, four tires, doors on the side, etc. I've got a minute here, so I'm just going to speed through this. But across the globe, we, we see shared designs and even shared blueprints. What about the so-called existence of transitional forms, tectolic, archaeopteryx, perhaps? Well, you know, that is those animals that seem to blend the features of, of two very different species. You could call these mosaics if you'd like. Well, think of a military vehicle that blends the features of both a land vehicle and a vehicle built for the ocean. For example, an amphibious assault vehicle. Or even think of a crossover vehicle that blends the features of both a van and an SUV. The point is homology, transitional forms, nested hierarchical patterns in anatomy, physiology, and genetics all fail to reject the design hypothesis. Both models can explain the data. Now I look forward to discussing with Mark the differentiating evidence that proves limited ancestry, explains biblical speciation, and all at the same time refutes Ponds come to people, fish to fishermen, evolution. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Standing for truth. We will now switch it over to Mark Grisdale for his opening statement. Mark, thanks so much for being here. Glad to have you, and the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot, James. So what I'm hearing again is I'm hearing that the tens of thousands of um, scientists out there are wrong that they somehow have it wrong and a limited handful of young earth creationists have it right. I, I really don't know where two laymen like Standing and myself can take this. I am not a, a, a person who specializes in biology. I'm not someone who specializes in genes, but we have tens of thousands of scientists out there who tell us that yes, this is a fact. We are going back close to 50 million years. We have found the ancestors that look a lot like us, but aren't quite us. They're kind of halfway between how hunched over and standing upright. We we have these people. Now he he talked about uh, retroviruses and just basically made an assertion and then skimmed over it that that is not evidence for 
um, for us evolving over, um, you know, literally millions of years, because we do go back to pond scum. That is really what we go back to, whether we like it or not. Um, we go back to fish, and then we go back to uh, reptiles, and then we go back to the original mammals, and then here we are today. To just make a statement that this is not true is not the way science works. The way science works is we look at all of the evidence, we weigh it out, and we look at what best suits or best describes what we see in the world. And we had a pretty good idea of what was going on long before genetics came along. Genetics, genetics is new. As we all know, it's last 40, 50 years we started working on genetics. Um, but before that, we would look in the fossil record. We would see this, uh, this very neatly laid out layer where we would go from very primitive to um, we would start to see the, the reptiles. And then we started to see the, uh, the minimalist uh, mammals. And then we seen them turn into, if we want to pretend that man is the ultimate in, um, in, in evolutionary um, design, if we want to be that arrogant to say that, then yes, uh, we, we can see where we went from monkeys and then into to humans. There is just so much evidence out there that, that I don't know why we're going to sit here and we're going to kind of, uh, you know, as two laymen, we're going to kind of play around with it and, and try to make science suit our point of view. I, I really don't have to to really stand up here and make much of a point except to say um, it, it, it's not the majority of scientists, it's not the, the majority of uh, biologists, it's not the majority of, of chemists, it's all of them except for the most extreme outliers. And yes, you can come up with four or 500 people who happen to also be religious that will, will find on your side and, and talk about these people like it's a lot. But there's on the other side, there's hundreds of thousands of scientists for every one person that wants to find in this, and I'm going to call it absurd worldview. It's just, it's not accurate. And I'm not sure how we can, um, yeah, I, I just don't know how we can go down this road as laymen and just make these assertions that science is wrong and standing Nephi Kent Holven is right. And I just want to get into the discussion. I, I, I really do. I, I've never even really heard um, standing talk before. I tried to get the chance this week to, to listen to him um, in some of his debates, and I, I was just unable to, um, to do it. I just didn't have a chance with this whole virus going on. Uh, I've been very busy. But uh, something that I, I would like to point out to Standing for Truth, and I told him that I'm in a really bad mood right now, and uh, how long do I got here, James? Do I still have a minute or two? About a minute. Okay, so right now we're dealing with the United States. I'm in Canada and we're dealing with a president in the United States and his wacky sidekick, uh, Pence there. And this, this is my problem with religion. When religion is allowed to run free, you get these situations where you get people like Donald Trump and Pence in charge of a system um, because he was voted in as a, well, he's a con man. He's not religious, but he pretends that he is. And this is the damage that it does. You gotta admit, Trump was, was voted in and Pence was voted in in the hopes that young earth creationism would be taught to kids in public schools. That's how he got voted in. Absolutely no doubt about it. So here's what we're living now. We've got this virus running rampant that's, um, that's going to keep us in our houses for at least three to four months. Don't think we're going to be out by, uh, by Easter by any stretch of the imagination. Where did this virus come for standing? Where where did this virus come from? Where was this virus on Noah's Ark? Um, About 10 seconds. Where did it come from? Where, where, corona, where did it come from? Was it on Noah's Ark? Who had it? Noah's wife, his kids, Noah? Who had it? Thank Go you. ahead. 
Thank you very much, Mark, for that opening statement. And yes, it's true. We hope you're all healthy and well out there, friends, as it's a wild one. You'll notice, like, I'm in Denver right now. Usually I stream from my office, but our building's completely locked down. Like completely. And so I, I had to find a new place to stream. And so this is like, oh, this is a good view. So with that, though, very excited for this open discussion section. So, gentlemen, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Okay, well, thanks so much for that opening there, Mark. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't see much more than arguments from majority. But if you do want to talk about viruses first and where this coronavirus may have come from and where viruses um, stand in the biblical creation model, well, I... <laughs> I definitely enjoy showing people that what they think they know about viruses for the most part is is wrong because it sounds like you assume that when you hear the word virus or think of viruses, you think of something bad. But um, little do most people know, actually, most viruses are actually beneficial. Like, do you know how many viruses roughly mark that we have in our body and in our genetics? Well, I know of parasites that we have that are uh, beneficial. Uh, absolutely. Can you name some of the uh, viruses that are oh, real quick, beneficial? Real quick, Mark, that... I don't want to interrupt, but I, I just asked you a question if you know how many viruses we have in our genetics. It's just a simple question. What, do you want a number? Do, more. How would I know that number? Do well, we I... have uh, viruses that are beneficial? Um, no, I don't know of any. So maybe you could tell us what what viruses are beneficial to us that we couldn't live without? Well, most viruses, what I'm saying, are actually beneficial, Mark. Um, the question you're asking and the question most people ask are, don't most viruses cause disease? So I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling anybody else who, who thinks that, that the answer is um, is no. We, we have even more viruses in our body than bacteria. And we know that bacteria is good. For example, bacteria is good in our um, our gut. And I'm sure you've even heard, Mark, that we have more bacteria in and on our bodies than we do cells. And yet we have more viruses in our body than we do bacteria. But the question I think we should be asking is, what are all these viruses doing? Well, what they are doing, Mark, and you might be aware of this, is they are actually controlling the number of bacteria in our gut and the number of species of bacteria. Mark, this is all about regulation. The viruses are regulating the number of bacteria. Without bacteria, uh, let's say in the ocean or in our uh, bodies, there would be an imbalance not only in our bodies, but also in the ecosystem. So the point is, and, and to answer your question, yes, the, the fact is most viruses are highly beneficial and incredibly important. Now, now, don't get me wrong, not all viruses are good. Of course, the, the, the coronavirus is not good, but most of them are good. Now, where do we get the, um, the bad viruses? Well, the fact is, let's say if you look at, we can just look at the uh, coronavirus, okay? So, um, Viruses in general, they don't cause disease, but when they jump from a different species, like this coronavirus did, the new species does not have the ability to regulate the virus properly, and the virus tends to burn hot and fast. Now, fortunately, you might be aware of Ebola, sometimes these viruses burn out, which is good. But the point is, viruses are beneficial, so they were created beneficial and highly important to our body, just like the endogenous retroviruses, they're highly functional DNA element. Uh, important in our genetics, but over time, if they cross species or based on a mutation, they can go from good to bad, but the majority are good. Go ahead. Are you, okay, we got to keep this shorter. I just looked up beneficial uh, viruses on Google and I just, I was actually in that speech able to read an entire thing and it, it says, no, there, there are no beneficial viruses that we couldn't live without as a matter of fact it says that some are not harmful to us and we'll go on unknowing um that we won't even know that we have them but no i i know of no viruses are you telling me there's viruses that we if we didn't have them we wouldn't be alive today keep these speeches a little shorter because this like i said i'm in a really bad mood because i really do blame trump on this and i blame religion on this because that stupid man wouldn't be in today if it wasn't for um, the religious South voting this idiot in. 
Well, I think what you're reading must be out, out of date because it is about regulation. That's where viruses are for. The viruses are regulating the number of bacteria. Like I said, without bacteria in the ocean, you might not even want to swim in the water, Mark, due to an imbalance taking place in the um, in the ecosystem. Your question and my answer regarding viruses in the biblical base model, and I know you're in a bad mood, and I'm sorry. I mean, this is a horrible situation <laughs> for, for, for everybody, and it's, it's not always a fun topic to talk about. Um, but where did these come from? Why did God create a virus designed to kill people? I mean, I get this question all the time, especially in this situation. Uh, but most viruses, like I said, they're created beneficial, or at least neutral, Mark, in, in the species they were created for. But when they jump species is the most important point to take from this they can go from good to uh, to bad so but all i can stay say standing is says you like like i said i'm still looking here and i can't see anything that says that we would not be alive today and as healthy as we are without viruses how do you you're just making a I, statement. No, I'm not making it. I just told you exactly what would happen if we didn't have all these viruses that are regulating the number of species of bacteria, not only in and on our bodies, but also in, in the ocean and in, in, in the ecosystem. There would be an imbalance in the ecosystem if it weren't for viruses, if it weren't for bacteria. Are you aware of the endogenous retroviruses? And Absolutely. The, okay, so uh, can you explain to me and, and the audience why I, I know that ERVs are not a direct, uh, you know, form of evidence for fish to fishermen, ponds come to people evolution. But what about endogenous retroviruses, Mark? Do you believe supports the theory? I, I I haven't made that claim, but all I know is that you can go back and you can see the DNA that's been inserted into our genes. You can see it in our DNA, and. Um, you can you can see when it was there you can see where we shared it with other animals the exact same retrovirus or the exact same virus you know you're making these claims but all i'm asking you to do is back it i'm not being rude i'm saying i can make claims too but where is the evidence that we couldn't live if there was not viruses on this earth name me one virus that i wouldn't be alive or that proves god today what what virus couldn't we live what do we need um good question so uh kind of how i iterated and then reiterated earlier viruses are important for the uh, balance of, of the bacteria in our body in the in the ecosystem so if uh, we didn't have these these viruses which outnumber cells and bacteria there would be an imbalance in regards to the endogenous retroviral functions i've got papers here that talk about how uh, the ervs are far from being junk dna the the papers say and i can send those to you if, if you want the um, evidence they're from second uh, papers it says the pervasive retro transposons that populate the genome mark have a powerful capacity to influence genes and chromatin and it's generally known too um, that ERVs frequently act to distribute regulatory information and what they do is they confer genes with uh, new patterns of expression and function so without these so-called ancient viral elements in in our genetics we're not going to uh, function we're not going to develop um as well as as we could if actually there's retroviral en elements in mouse embryos that if they're removed the mouse doesn't develop it, it develops and all of a sudden it stops because that retro virus or that retro transposon was removed so they're highly functional and, and beneficial i can send you all these papers uh um, are, are you aware of, of the functions that have been found in, in the ERVs? Take your time, I know I talked a lot there. Absolutely not. I cannot think of where a retrovirus, and that they are not expressed. So I do not know what right now you are talking about. You're making claims without a basis. There, there is absolutely no way that you can- Well, I just said I have the papers, tonight. sorry to interrupt. I do have the papers if, if you'd like That's that. fine. And 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 they, they need to be peer reviewed papers that they say are. that they if are. that mouse hadn't gone through so every cold we get every flu we get every sickness we get do you agree that that injects into us in a way it cuts into our dna and it and it, it expresses itself as a retrovirus can we agree on that 
Well, Mark, you said that we can see the insertions of these endogenous retroviruses. Well, the reasons why they are called ancient, ancient viral remnants or ancient viral infections is because they would have inserted themselves millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago. So we actually never seen them inserted. So that's why the question is, are these really the, re the ancient remnants of viral infections? Because if what we now know is that these retro transposons, the ERVs, for example, they, they can jump around the genome and they can turn on and off various types of genes. I, I will send you the paper where um, it shows that there's the specific class of retro transposons, uh, Mark, in, in the mouse embryo, because um, you did touch on that. And, and I'd love to show you the paper because it does show that if you deactivate it, the mouse embryo will develop and then stop. And as I said earlier, it's because it depends on the function of these retro transposons, which evolutionists have always assumed um, was junk DNA, right? They'll take these ERVs and they'll look at ones in humans, chimps, monkeys, and they'll say that the nested hierarchical pattern and distribution of these ERVs prove um, common descent. But what we now know is that these ERVs are you know, functional DNA elements important to the, to the genome. So what you said is true about cold viruses, flu viruses, but this is when they cross species, okay? That's why they are harmful. But the viruses in our body, they don't cause disease. Those are actually highly important um, for, for, for our genetics, for the ecosystem. Um, I mean, if, if you're not aware of, of, of this information, that's completely fine, but um, ERVs are like junk DNA. It's, it's all been overturned. Um, it's, it's just not good evidence for um, evolution. Viruses in general, to be honest with you, I think as I'm proving here, fits far, far better in a, in a biblical base model, Mark. Go ahead. Well, nothing fits in a, in a base model. In, in everyday science, nothing fits into the biblical model. That, that's the problem that we have. And science would embrace the Bible. I swear to you, I would embrace the Bible if you could just show me one piece of evidence that would make me think to myself, that is really unexplainable. That's got to be magic. That's got to be a God. I but could do that. every single thing that we see lines up with genetic. It lines up with biology. I do not know how you are sitting here saying to us right now that there, like, so you're telling me that this mouse would not develop past the embryonic stage if it wasn't for these viruses? Is, is that really what you're trying to tell us? See, here's the question though, Mark, is are these um, ancient viral infections, are these endogenous retroviruses, the retro transposons, are they actually the result of um, the ancient infections back in the day, hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, to millions of years ago. Because remember, what you said was that you can see the insertions on these retroviruses. That's not actually true. So we should be asking ourselves, are these actually leftover remnants or are they created units of, of DNA function? Because evolutionists for years have said that they are just junk no function, they're um, remnants of ancient viral infections, but that's because, and, and I will agree that they do have similarities, Mark, to actual viruses. So the evolutionists, you know, the scientists, they predicted that these sequences would be non-functional. That's why they look to the shared ones between chimps and humans to say that this is evidence for um, common descent. But as I've shown over and over again here, the evidence is actually looking like they're not remnants of viral infections, but they're actually functional DNA units. This is consistent with our created heterozygosity hypothesis that suggests the vast majority of our DNA, DNA units, for example, are created initially by God. And, and viruses um, demonstrate this. I mean, do you disagree with anything that I've said in regards to the um, the science behind the viruses, the retro transposons, is there anything that I can clear up for you regarding it? Yeah, I disagree with it all. There, there's not one evidence. Like I've been looking. I, you, everyone can see me looking down here. I am looking for beneficial viruses on Google. I can't find one thing that says that if it wasn't for these viruses. And don't forget standing. There are millions of them in our genetics. Exactly. Millions actually, of Google, them. how many viruses do we have? I think it's actually trillions of, of viruses we have in our okay, genetics. Okay, let's go with trillions they of them. They outnumber our cells and bacteria. Okay, 
But right now we're picking them up at a rate of, from what I can see here, we're picking them up at a rate of about three to four a year. How did we get trillions of them if there's not a common ancestry? They were created that way. I just explained it, Mark. You got to listen. We were created with viruses with viruses bacteria you understand that bacteria are incredibly for example bacteria in your blood that will be infectious bacteria in your gut that's that's healthy that's why people say after rounds of antibiotics hey take a round of uh, probiotics so you can uh you can get those good bacteria back i mean mark just look at swans geese and ducks okay you do realize that they have influenza viruses that they actually carry they carry all the variations of influenza this is a fact now, when these animals defecate in the water, okay, and then you go swimming in that water, as gross as it sounds, Mark, you're actually covered in viruses. And the question is, what are these beneficial roles of these viruses in ducks and geese? Because they're not going around with, with the flu all the time, because those influenza viruses in the ducks, in the geese, for example, they are beneficial, just like our viruses are beneficial to us. But when they jump from a different species, and I've said this over and over again, so we may just have to dis agree to disagree and go on to something else. But when they jump from a different species, Mark, the new species does not have the ability to regulate the virus properly. That's the issue here with the coronavirus. So now the virus, for example, with the coronavirus, the H1N1, Ebola, it's now burning hot and fast. Our body doesn't recognize it. That's why with the coronavirus, I think it's a week or something. You can go without symptoms. And unfortunately, now you can pass it on to 100 different people that's why this self-isolation is incredibly important but these are the ones that cross species mark that's when they go from good to bad and i understand you disagree you may just have to disagree to disagree but th these are actually facts mark well what i'm hearing you saying is that we're very much like the animal kingdom we pretty much share the same genetics with the animal kingdom which pretty much backs up everything that i say we are part of the animal kingdom if we weren't, we would be different. We wouldn't get colds. We wouldn't have an anus to shit out of. We wouldn't have a mouth to eat out of. Uh, we wouldn't have blood. There would be something about us that would be different, that would be obvious. We would have a different way of reproducing. Like if you go back to the Old Testament, apparently God showed Adam a bunch of animals and those animals were to be his mate, his, um, his, uh, to keep him company. Why did Adam, um, why was he able to produce sperm if Adam was to be the only man on earth? The, the whole thing just doesn't make sense. You can't wrap it into a present that makes sense. It's just really, um, well, it, it well, doesn't Mark, make sense to me. Why, why would God if, make animals one species that carries viruses that could kill another species? Not just another species. Well, that's because the, of genetic degeneration. But, they weren't originally the created species, this way. Let me just say this. The species of his choice these are, 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 we are the ones that are apparently made in God's image. Why would there be other species like swans out there that need to carry these viruses that can kill us? Right. So these viruses were created beneficial. That's why the most, most of your viruses, most of your bacteria, for example, are beneficial. It's when they cross species, it's when they mutate that they become Bad, I guess you could say. So this is all based on the biblical based model of uh, genetic entropy, the fall, the accumulation of near neutral and deleterious mutations, Mark. I mean, we accumulate. Are you aware that we accumulate about 100 new mutations per person per generation? OK, so that means uh, your kids and their kids' kids are going to be more and more mutant than their parents, than their grandparents. Now, there's got to be a type of selection that can remove these deleterious mutations from our genetics. I mean, do you have a type of natural selection that can um, stop this genetic degeneration that we do see occurring in not only humans, but also in all, um, all forms of life? I mean, you say that you would uh, like to see evidence for creation. Well, you can take this accumulation of, of mutations to a point of least mutation accumulation. That would be a point of 
of uh, creation, Adam and Eve. We can see that based on mutation accumulation, mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome DNA. I mean, you listen to my opening. Is, is that not convincing to you that we can directly trace through our genetics? We can directly trace ourselves back to two common ancestors, Adam and Eve, just as the Bible, um, just as the Bible says. Isn't that what you would expect to find, uh, Mark? Take your time. Take your time. But we don't. We don't. We do. We do. If, if we use the empirical method, Mark, as, as I explained in, in the opening, uh, we can look at, say, mitochondrial DNA. OK, let's look at that small DNA compartment. We inherit, as you know, uh, mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. Now, Absolutely. everybody on this planet got their mitochondrial DNA. This is a fact from a single woman. And this woman, Mark, is exactly what we would expect from the biblical Eve. She's literally the mother of us all. And this is based on observed mutation rates not using divergence and evolutionary based assumptions just looking at pedigree based studies we can trace our mitochondrial dna back to one single woman six thousand years ago i mean isn't that exactly what you would expect if you wanted evidence for a literal eve and a literal adam and if not what's your evidence against um, the genetic data i'm talking about my evidence is the earth is older than six thousand years old um, I would really like to keep our comments and, and believe me, I'm not putting you down here. Let's just change the way we do this. Let's do a one question for one answer um, style of debate because we're going to run out of time and I, I'm really enjoying talking to you. This is very different than talking to Ken. So I'm going to ask you one. <laughs> I'm, I'm having fun ask too, you, Mark. I'm having fun. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one question. Are you saying that we would not be alive today if it wasn't for bacteria and viruses? Okay, so if you want to go back to the virus topic, that is exactly what I'm saying, okay? The ALUs that populate our genome, the endogenous retroviruses, the, the, all these classes of retrotransposons, as I've indicated earlier, the bacteria. Are you, I mean, why do you think people take probiotics? I mean, bacteria, our healthy gut flora is dependent on our bacteria. Now, like I said, I mean, bacteria in the blood, E. coli, for example, that's going to lead to infection, of course. Uh, but the viruses that populate our genome, populate the ecosystem, they are there for regulation um, purposes. I mean, there would be an imbalance in, in the ecosystem. I mean, these are symbiotic relationships that we are looking at. So this is, yes, I will say, I'll keep it short, viruses and bacteria are created by God Okay, they were perfect. They are beneficial now, but some are bad due to genetic entropy, genetic degeneration. Oh, you're done. Okay, that, that was a weird <laughs> end. Okay. Oh, wow. What do I say? Yes, we can live without this. Yet. Bacteria in our gut is beneficial to a point. It continues to break down our waste product. If we were designed by God, and, and I know this is going to sound terrible, and, and you know, take it for what it is out there, uh, believers, does God poop? That's my question to you. So your question, so everything that I've discussed about mitochondrial DNA, Y nope. chromosome DNA, does your God question poop? is, does God poop? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. He's, okay. he's an eternal spiritual being who's outside time matter and and space he's obviously in so it god in so no. god doesn't eat either god doesn't eat we eat though where is creation i just want to say i just googled benefits of viruses a bunch of things came up that look at this one it says why viruses deserve a better reputation viruses you've heard the bad here's the good now right benefits of of uh, bacteria i mean mark i want you to have an open mind here and, and look at the data but um you know your arguments here so far aren't really um, all that good. Benefits of bacteria. Here we go. Creating products such as ethanol and enzymes, killing plant pests, cleaning up oil spills and toxic waste. Good for our gut. Good for our immune system. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I can go on and on and on and on. So, yeah, the just, evidence. OK, let me answer one question. What you just covered there is absolutely the truth. We know that bacteria can clean up oil spills. We've known that forever. That has nothing to do with us living on. That has to do with um, oil being cleaned up by a bacteria. Right. Everything right. you just talked about is just that bacteria has found a way in our systems to eke out a living that's beneficial 
to us, but we don't need them. Well, that's a but that's an assumption because just like the ERVs, Mark, you can't actually show me, you know, empirically a, a virus inserting itself into our germ lines because it would have to be in the germ lines, not our somatic cells, to be passed on. You can't show me that. All we see are these. Um, DNA units, okay? Evolutionists assume that they are junk from, you know, past evolutionary common ancestors. But what we now know is that they are incredibly functional in our genetics. Yeah, the bacteria is good for a, a multitude of things. For the human being, they help break down food. They help keep us healthy. They help uh, with healthy immune responses. Um, and you're saying that, you know, they co-opted these functions or some type of rescue device, but you can't show me that, Mark. You can't present me with, I debated a biologist recently and we were talking about endogenous retroviruses and that's what he said. He said, oh, these functions were co-opted, you know, to be incredibly important in the placenta, the embryo, the immune system. I said, show me a, a paper that actually uh, demonstrates this co-option. And he said, well, I'd be lying to you if, if I could show you that. See, this is all based on an evolutionary assumption. I mean, can't you see that and at least admit that, Mark? No, no, not at all. If I was a god and I was to produce a human being, that human being wouldn't be reliant on air. He wouldn't need food. He wouldn't need to defecate. He wouldn't get viruses. He wouldn't have a body that continually breaks down. There are so many things that I would do differently. And I am merely a human being and I could do a much better job. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yes, we are the fallen. We're, we're paying for our sins. We're eating an apple, this, that, and the other. But why do we look exactly like our animal kingdom brothers? Okay. Well, Why do we look question. exactly like them? And that's a good question. That's a good question that, that you're asking, okay? What you're referring to is the nested hierarchical patterns that, that we see. I mean, this is fundamental to biology. And, and you're right, Mark. You know, um, I, I, I get a lot of uh, people asking me, you know, what about uh, these nested hierarchies, right? The groups within groups patterns that we see in, in life, you know, or, and the nested hierarchical classification of life that you would say uh, points to and fits nice and neatly in with uh, descent with modification. But you can even look at this on, on a genetic level. I mean, you can look at uh, neutral variation, uh, for, for example. But from a design perspective, okay, uh, if we're made in God's image, we can get a sense for the, um, you know, how, how did God create us? We can get a sense for it by how we create things. So uh, if you look at modes of transportation, modes and means of transportation, Mark, but standing, we have designed, I just cut I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Because you're okay. asking, why are we all so similar to um, each other? Why is there nested hierarchies in biology? And and I'm agreeing with you, but it's also consistent with, with our model because humans, we design and build um, within um, groups within groups, nested hierarchical patterns. Just look at modes of transportations. We can see these patterns at the visible level and the blueprint level. But here's the difference, Mark. Okay, and then I'm gonna let you talk as long as you want. We both predict these types of patterns. Okay, this is the way God created. This is the way we create, and we're made in His image, so it makes sense. Now, the differentiating factor is we should, if universal common ancestry is true, we should be filled with genomic fossils, junk DNA, evolutionary leftovers. But what we now see is quite the opposite, okay? Because the trajectory suggests a genome of function. And we see that in the ERVs, we see that in the pseudo genes. So that right there, function is key, Mark. So yeah, I agree with the nested hierarchical patterns we see in, in biology, that's a fact. But the differentiate differentiating evidence is on our side go ahead take your time yeah but we don't see that we see exactly the opposite we're not made in the image of god we wake to reproduce we have to find a woman we have to inject sperm into her it has to meet the egg at the right point um we are That's not fine. we are not made in any image of a god, we we are made exactly the same as an animal. You cut us, we bleed just like an animal. We fall I off. Let, let me ask you this simple question. And, and let's keep this really short because we're running out of time here. And I can't believe it because I, I feel like I just got started. I hope we, <laughs> we get a little extra all night, time. No, I, I enjoy talking to you. Okay. 
So let me ask you a question. Was Adam made to live forever? Simple question. Yes or no? Yes. He was made to live forever. Correct. Adam's teeth could live forever. Adam's joints could live forever. What happens if Adam fell off of a cliff? Would he just live as a ball of jelly at the bottom of a cliff? Could he die? Okay, good good question. So you've asked a few questions. I've said yes, yes. Your last one's more of a theological-based question that I'm happy to answer. But I do like how you talked about sperm and egg reproduction. Okay, the reason why God created us this way is so we can see in genetics, in biology, the evidence for him. As I indicated earlier, Mark, based upon the actual empirically observed mutation rate for the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, studies indicate that we... Um, come from two, two ancestors. I mean, we can see that in, in our low genetic diversity, mitochondrial leave and Y chromosome Adam. Now, evolutionists, of course, they have done similar analyses, but they're not using, and you might be aware of this, Mark, they're not actually using observed mutation rates. Okay, they have been compelled, unfortunately, because of the data we have regarding these DNA compartments. Um, they've now chosen to use hypothetical mutation rates that are actually 10 or 20 fold lower than what is observe and they only justify this mark based on certain evolutionary assumptions you asked if adam could live forever and i indicated earlier that based on mutation accumulation okay you, i want you to i asked the question earlier what type of selection can remove these uh, deleterious mutations 100 new mutations per person per generation in our germ cell lines i mean this is a this is a fact so you take that back mark to a point of least mutation accumulation a point of least genetic entropy that is a point of creation, Adam and Eve, who could have lived uh, forever. Yeah, they fell, they ate the the, the fruit and, and it brought a death and decay and extinction into the universe. And this is exactly what we see with, uh, with, with genetic entropy. So can you just maybe take some time um, to kind of explain the science behind um, genetic degeneration and mitochondrial Eve? Because I'm telling you that all of, all of genetics uh, proves and, and demonstrates that we come from uh, just two ancestors, Eve, Adam, just thousands of years ago. Take your time, Mark. Well, of course we do, but it's not Adam and Eve. It's a slow uh, generational change from monkeys, from primates. There's a reason that we exactly match primates. Um, Everything and, and now I, I know what you said there at the beginning, and I, I've heard this from a lot of creationists, and I didn't realize that I was going to be talking to somebody tonight that actually believed in a 6,000 year old earth. Um, but yes, that that is what science finds. There is no conspiracy. I'm an engineer. I don't get a paper every month in the mail saying this is the latest conspiracy that we're going to push on uh, the layman of the earth. I am telling you, I am promising you on my life, there is no conspiracy. Science. I'm not there's a cons Actually, there's quite the opposite of a conspiracy because as I indicated, based on the empirical method, based on observed mutation rates and not only the mitochondrial DNA, but also the Y chromosome, it actually takes us back to two ancestors just 6,000 years ago. Genetics, are what are inherited sperm and egg, not a rock, not a fossil, not geology. I know you want to keep going to these indirect lines of evidence, but the only direct line of evidence for ancestry is our genetics, our traits. And these all confirm um, that we come from just two ancestors just 6,000 years ago. How do you explain the low genetic diversity, Mark? And I want you to answer this question, okay? Every single human being on this planet is 99.9% .9 similar. And, and our Y chromosome is all 99.9% .9 similar. That's why they say we came from a Y chromosomal ancestor. Even the evolutionists admit that. Yeah, they say that Y chromosomal uh, ancestor was part of a population, even though that's just a uh, fairy tale. But the question is, why? Why do we have, as a species, low genetic diversity and the chimp Y chromosome and our Y chromosome? Guess what? It's only 70% dissimilar when it should be the most similar chromosome to us because you said supposedly we are related to chimps so there's two or three questions there take your time um and, and, and hopefully you can answer those mark well of course we do i i i don't know what you're asking you're making these assertion these assertions that you know these things 
but it's against science. Science does not say that we're 6,000 years I do old. Have this, I do have the peer-reviewed secular papers that, that, are you disagreeing with the data that suggests the chimp Y chromosome and the human Y chromosome 70% dis, you, you realize that the Y chromosome doesn't have a counterpart to uh, recombine with, right? I mean, you can get some, some variation there with, with gene conversion, for example, but that means it should be the most similar chromosome to humans, but why is it so dissimilar? I mean, do you have any any answer to that? I mean, it just sounds like you're kind of waving away the, the evidence. It's, but I it's not your... dissimilar. It's not dissimilar at all. Seventy percent dissimilar. No, it, it it's not. You're yes, making these claims. No, no it's fact. it's not. How similar you're, you're is making... the chimp Y chromosome to the human Y chromosome then? Well, why are you going back to the chimp? How about the, the bonobo? Have you gone to the bonobo? That is what they think. Same maybe. Thing. Pardon. It, it'll probably be about stuff. So you're saying that the chimp is our closest common ancestor. Therefore, we should look at the Y chromosome. I never chromosome. said that. I never said that. I said I I said that we have evolved. We are an ape. I have never said the word chimp tonight, and I I no, defy I, anybody to go no, back and find the word chimps. chimp. We're not chimps. I'm saying we our closest we're common apes. ancestor is a chimpanzee. Are you disagreeing with that according to the evolutionary literature? No, we're apes. We're, we're Wait, not chimps. Our closest common ancestors. Okay, who split six million years ago from, it was the human and chimps that split apes. from a common ancestor. We're not chimpanzees. We're apes. Okay, here's the question, though. It's very simple. Why are is every single human being on the planet 99.9% .9 similar? Why is our Y chromosomes incredibly identical okay indicating we why? came from oh yeah but yeah why and why is our so-called closest common ancestor in the animal kingdom i understand you're saying that we're all apes okay i get it but why is the chimps y chromosome only 70 percent similar to our y chromosome it should be a lot more similar if we're related according to you go ahead take your time why we're we're going back 50 million years so let's let's look at another years? species for the chimp human common ancestor 50 million okay. let's take our time you said i could take my time so man has been has been evolving now for at least the last hundred thousand years right. we did not come from an ape we at one point split off the tree and we became what we are today we can see it. We see that we have Neanderthal DNA in us. We can see what happened. But let's go to a different species. So you're asking me. Yeah, but you me, still didn't answer. Yeah, but you didn't answer. No, if you let want, me answer. If you want you're to just saying say you to me, why is one species so genetically the same? If we weren't the same species that was so genetically the same, we would be another species, just like Neanderthals are another species of, of uh, erectus. Like, I don't know what you're asking. At a certain point, well, when Neanderthals, you get a are, are you aware of you're not letting me talk. I've never okay, talked to you. Okay, take your time. You. Take your time. I'm sorry. When we diverge, and just like Neanderthal did, and which we bred with, we have 3 to 4% of Neanderthal DNA in our, our DNA makeup. When you diverge, you end up with a species. What you're talking about, if we weren't so genetically the same, we would no longer be a species. It would make a new species that we would no longer be able to breed with. You need a certain amount of genetic compatibility to remain a species. So I don't know why you're asking me, why is it that humans carry this this unique uh genetic makeup that allows themselves to be a complete species we can still breed together of course we can and if we went off and diverged to a point we would become another species but you would have to break us off in onto an island we would have to have no interbreeding and yes that human colony would become another species and i guarantee you within a few thousand years, maybe 10,000, we would no longer be able to interbreed with them. So I don't know why you're surprised that a species has this common genetic makeup. Of course we do. We interbreed with each other continually. 
um, a African American or an African African man continually breathe with an Asian woman. We are constantly um, exchanging genes. Of course, human beings, we, we breed with each other uh, uh, across the pond, across the oceans. We are constantly doing this. Of course, the species will stay the same. We are acting as one species and we're moving along. If you were to take a group of us, throw us on an island and, and cut off complete um, compatibility with other human beings, yes, it would become a, a different species within a certain amount of time. We know this, we watch it in the animal kingdom. It's called a ring species. We see it all the time. Uh, okay, th um, thanks for that. You made a lot of good points there, uh, Mark. And to be honest with you, I'm really enjoying this. We could probably do this all night. Um, with the Neanderthals, yeah, like for example, our genome is the same size. We have the same genes. We have the same number of, um, chromosomes and even DNA barcoding prove that um, our species and Neanderthals are actually all human, the same species. Um, when they sequence the Neanderthal um, genome, um, the out of Africa, you know, hypothetical bottleneck hypothesis um, actually became more problematic because the Neanderthals, which we now know are, are, are um, fully human, Mark. They also interbred with with Europeans and other people groups. For example, the uh, like if you look at Erectus, Nelidi, Heidelbergensis, uh, the Denisovans. I even believe the Hobbits. Uh, you know, they were all one. They intermingled, interbred. Um, for example, but uh, this actually would would contradict the evolutionary near extinction hypothesis. Can I stop you there for one second? Sure. Uh, my point there is just showing that Neanderthals are human, just like us. But yeah, stop me. Go ahead. How do you fit this in 4,000 years since the flood? How do you come up with all these, the hobby? Well, let you, okay, let me answer that question. That's a good question. The Neanderthals, where are you fitting these in? Right. And that's a, that's a good question. So there's a paper that came out recently that showed that there were certain groups of Neanderthals that were 40% less fit than uh, modern humans today. They were highly inbred. They had an incredible fixation of, of deleterious mutations. That's what happens when you inbreed. And you can also see this with, believe it or not, with the uh, with the hobbits. You can see this with uh, Homo naledi. Okay, uh, various... just one sec. One sec, let me ask you a question. So just, you're uh, saying, who the hell's got the police coming? I, we haven't done anything that deserves the police. <laughs> James, they're coming after you, buddy. They're coming after you. Let me ask you a question, okay? You're talking about inbreeding of the Neanderthals. Correct. Are, are you, now again, I have not- I know what you're going to get, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I won't even say it. Every the, Everybody no, in no. the audience that's intelligent no, the inbreeding, knows exactly though. what I'm going to ask. So Here's we the problem. had six, eight people, no, six people on the ark. Okay, Explain so he, that. Here's a good question. Here's a good question. For one, I, I, what I wanted to ask you regarding the Neanderthal. So, for example, these um, so-called primitive humans or, you know, variations in the human species is better understood as subpopulations of uh, people groups that split apart after Babel. And unfortunately, they became isolated, which led to inbreeding. It led to genetic um Degeneration. So that's how we would explain. And that's why I went into the low genetic diversity in humans. We're all 99.9% .9 similar because that actually proves that we came from a small population and not just a small population, a population of just two, Adam and Eve. That's why the evolutionists had to come out uh, with the hypothetical out of Africa bottleneck, which says Back that. Back to the ark. Back to the ark. Well, yeah, we and have... you're asking about the inbreeding. You're asking about the inbreeding. But the thing is, the inbreeding. 4,000 years ago, we've got two adults and their children and their wives. How did we do this? And believe me, I raise animals. This is my life. I do lions and tigers. If you breed the sisters with the brothers, with the mothers, right. with the grandmothers, with the aunts, you really do end up with some really unhealthy animals. So like what you're saying here is completely 
um, counterdicting what you're saying. We cannot have these Neanderthals. We can't have the hobbits. We can't have all these people and you seem to accept the fossil record which i give you credit well, quick, for thank well, you well because you're going on to, on too many rabbit trails so i want to answer your question about the um inbreeding that that you say is a problem with with the biblical base model now um, allow me to answer it as, as to why it's not a problem but then allow me to respond with a question that i believe makes the inbreeding problem actually more of a problem to you okay so okay. uh for us, for example, why the bottlenecks at creation, why the bottlenecks at Babel and, and post-flood are not a problem is it, from the biblical perspective is, is because, as you know, Mark, it sounds like you at least know your Bible a little bit. We start with just two people. OK, and then 10 generations later, um, a second single generation bottleneck of just eight people occurred at the time of the flood. Here's why it's not a problem is because both bottlenecks were very brief. Okay. Just one generation. And then they were followed by exponential growth. And in both cases, Mark, there would be almost no previously accumulated mutations, especially because we explain the vast number of DNA differences as created diversity, the created heterozygosity hypothesis, for example. So, you know, the, there'd be no inbreeding effects in our model and in very limited human genetic diversity, as I keep uh, talking about here in the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA and the human species does demonstrate that we came from a small population, Adam and Eve. Now it's not a problem for us, but it's a huge problem for you. And then I'm going to turn around and, and ask you the question and I want you to answer it. Um, the reason why it's a problem for you is because now you got to look at the out of Africa population bottleneck theory to explain the low genetic diversity. They say that there was probably about 70,000 years ago, a near extinction event. And they, they use this to reduce homogeneity. Okay. Now here's the problem, Mark. Okay. In, in your story, this would actually cause permanent and severe genetic damage because it wasn't just one or two generations like ours. It was actually thousands and thousands of, of generations, you know, enormous numbers of deleterious mutations in this story would go to fixation. So let me ask you this, then here's the question. I'll make it plain and simple. How could such a tiny, nearly extinct, okay, in this out of Africa scenario, I think it was Homo erectus that evolved into Homo sapiens, this genetically compromised population apparently suddenly exploded into all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet and yet and yet this population was inbreeding for not one generation not two generations but many gener generations so how is this even feasible go ahead well what you're asking me is to explain how the out of africa um hypotheses work how does the arc Apothe like well, I just explained, Mark, I just answered and you promised you would answer my question, okay? Because yeah, your, I will. your bottleneck involved an extended near extinction event associated with severe inbreeding, but ours wasn't extended. We also don't explain the vast majority of DNA differences as mutations like you do. And all the bottlenecks were followed by exponential and rapid population growth. The inbreeding is not a problem for us, but from you, it remains a very serious theoretical Problem. So I'm just asking you, how is this bottleneck hypothesis even remotely feasible? Take your time. I mean, you gave me the respect to answer, and now I just want you to answer. I don't know what you're asking me. There's only one bottleneck theory out there. Yes, during the Ice Age, we got down to very few human beings. I think they say around 40,000, which is considered a genetic bottleneck. I'm going to ask you one more time, how did we get off the ark in a field of mud and, and, and repopulate the earth with six people? Okay, so I'm just going to say that it's okay that you don't understand the, uh, the question about the, um, you know, severe. I understand what you're saying. You're asking me to explain the genetic bottleneck that we had 10,000 years ago during oh, the it Ice Age. No, it was about 70,000. Some say to, that the bottleneck reduced the human population to about 2,000. Others say 10,000. The reason why they invoke this is to explain the low genetic diversity, right? They needed a way, and inbreeding would be the perfect way for many generations to reduce this uh, homogeneity. But the question but is... But do you understand that 10,000 is considered a bottleneck 
not yes, sex. Yes. We see it in the cheetah. Do you know that we can take a cheetah and we can take skin grafts? We can take any organ. We can take the blood. We can take anything out of a cheetah and we can pass it on to another cheetah. We don't even do testing. We don't care. We can save that cheetah without even checking on it. When you take a lynx, like I had a Canadian lynx that was sick. And uh, we needed a blood transfusion really bad to save this, uh, this Canadian lynx. And we couldn't do it. I could not find another Canadian lynx with acceptable blood to transfuse into this Canadian lynx to save it. Because it never it, uh, got to the point where it had a genetic bottleneck. But, but the, the cheetah did. It got down to 10 to 20,000 individuals. We can right. take any piece of skin. Mark, is it okay if I cut you off? Because I, I like that you brought up the cheetahs. Do you absolutely? Not, do you know in Google how many cheetahs are left on this planet? Because I just looked it up the other day. Because um, I've always said about ten thousand. I did a debate recently with Gutsit Gibbon, who um, had a hard time answering this question too. It's it's okay because the thing is, the answer to it is nothing but post hoc ad hoc. Now, if you Google it, the cheetahs are down to about seven thousand. And that's conservationists right. feel that, am I right? Yeah, that's yeah, about and, right. And, right. And Last I heard we were down to about 6,000 of them. Right. And that's not good. That's not good. So conservationists feel the cheetah is already showing serious signs of inbreeding and, and genetic decline because small bottleneck populations, as you know, have very significant problems. There's just not enough of these, these cheetahs. Uh, now their sperm is degenerate. Um, Mark, the, the genetic diversity has eroded due to the inbreeding. The species is has been expressing many uh, deleterious recessive mutations. But guess what? Guess what? We're not going to see this population of 6,000 cheetahs suddenly explode into all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet. Yet that's what the evolutionist says happened 70,000 years ago with this small bottleneck population of two to 10,000 humans. They say they suddenly see the man over, over the why I can't know. cheetahs do that? The only reason that cheetahs cannot take dominion over the earth is because there's man with guns. Man did not go up against man. Man was free to do whatever he wanted to. We are a species of animal that has taken over this planet. We have taken control of this planet and no animal stands a chance against us. Are you saying to me that if the cheetah wanted to move to North America, it would just move here? With human intervention or without, it's not going to because of the uh, destructive mutates. It's too highly inbred and genetically damaged, just like this so-called hypothetical population of 10,000. I see people in the chat saying I didn't answer the question about our bottleneck. I did very extensively. We start with just two people, Adam and Eve, and then 10 generations later, we have a second single generation bottleneck of just eight people occurred. These were not extended, and these were all followed by rapid exponential growth um, in, in, in population, there wouldn't be any inbreeding effects. And you asked, how could they uh, speciate? How could we get um, all, all the different people on the planet just from two people? And that's a really, really good question because you may have heard me in, in my response there, um, Mark, and it, um, that we explain the vast, vast majority of nuclear DNA differences as the result of, of created DNA diversity. Okay, so. That is a good question you asked. And I remember you asked it to Nath and you've asked it before and I think you deserve a good answer, okay? Um, we do have to, we'll actually, give you a chance. Before I go on, did you want, what's give, that? Uh, I'll give you James? a chance to respond, but then we do have to go to the Q&A pretty quick here. Okay. Why, you gotta go to bed, James? Yes, basically. <laughs> James, we're all on quarantine. Let's just do this all night, 10 hours yeah, a day. Yeah, <laughs> come on, James. Give us a little we're bit just, more time we're here, just getting please. started. Give us another half an hour, James. Can you do that? I don't think I can do that. I can give you maybe like 10 minutes tops and then we Okay, let's do 10 Q minutes cuz you cuz it sounds like we have a good Q&A. We could always do a, okay. a round 2 as well. So Okay, let's do that. Let's set okay. that up as soon as we can. And so what I'm going to say what I'm going to say back to you standing for truth is okay. you're 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 dancing around this problem of when we get down to genetic diversity that we just cannot 
have a species that can come out of even 6,000 animals, let alone six. Right. I want to You've explain that, a yes. Big you problem deserve an there. answer to and that. And not only do you, just let me talk. You, not only do you have a big problem with six individuals, you've got a problem with, I, I, do you believe in the ark? Do you actually believe in the ark? Well, Mark, I, I do. I do. But, but okay, before you go there, on, just, just real quick. There. And I'm going to so give good, you plenty of time. So good good I, Lord, I, you believe in the ark. So not only did six individuals get well, Mark, off Mark, that real ark. Quick, real quick, I, I don't appreciate the insults because I got to be honest with you with the endogenous retro. I didn't viruses, insult. I didn't DNA, involve. mitochondria leave Y chromosome, Adam. I've given more than enough evidence to support my position. To be honest with you, you haven't really given any any rebuttals to it. I do, I do agree that that you. I want to give you the respect of answering the question about how can we get all the people groups and and the species uh, that we see today from just two, two people, Adam and Eve, and also from a handful of, of kinds. You deserve an answer to that uh, question, and and that's why I iterated that. Uh, genetics traits that's what's inherited and genetically mark okay it, it goes back to this um, this idea this is fundamental in, in genetics a big a little a right alleles okay allelic diversity and allelic potential so we got little a big a you know big b little b now if adam and eve okay and this is what we're proposing we're created genetically whole homogeneous okay let's say they had no absolutely no variety mark in in their dna say all capital letters or all lowercase letters then mark i would agree with you i would be in your position fighting the creationists because yes it would be extremely difficult to create variety in just a few thousand years you're right but the thing is this goes to the kinds of animals that, that you're talking about too, that we say God created. Adam and Eve and these kinds, okay? With capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, if we created, if God created Adam and Eve and, and the created kinds, heterozygous, not homogeneous, okay? So let's say we do this for the millions of DNA positions that exist. That means they have the potential to produce all sorts of variety, even in a single generation. And now, as I pointed out earlier, we now have multiple lines of evidence, Mark, that indicates this actually was the case, that God created Adam and Eve and the kinds in the beginning so that they have the potential within themselves to speciate and to produce all sorts of variety. And in the case of, of animal kinds, uh, as a matter of fact, as you would know, we can actually see, see this um, in, in the echo of, of breeds. For example, but that's because we explain the vast majority of DNA differences as created DNA differences. As compared to you, you explain it as mutation. So you're assuming evolution, Mark. That's the problem. We see evolution. We watch it every day. We we see it in animals. We we see that when an animal gets broken off into a group, a subgroup, they became a, they become a new species. It doesn't even take long. You've got a group of finches and they work their way around a mountain. Guess what? On the other end, they can no longer breathe together. This happens so fast. We've got creationists continually asking us to show us this happening in front of their eyes. And can we can. You. We can show them it happening. But what I say to you again, and I haven't heard an answer, is how could we possibly get on an ark sail around the earth for a year, get off in an absolute mud pit with six people and produce the human generation that we have today within 4,000 years or 4,400 years or whatever. Okay, let me ask been. you a question, Mark, because I feel like you didn't listen to anything I said. How I listened you, to it all. I, wanna, well, just, I, want, I want you to uh, answer two questions, okay? And they're going to be really quick and then I'll respond. How do we or how do I explain the vast, vast majority of DNA differences that we see within ourselves and within species? And then how do you as an evolutionist explain and what do you attribute the vast, vast majority of DNA differences too. Go answer those. We two don't questions. see we don't see vast just, differences in DNA in humans because we are continually breeding with each other. We are continually driving from um, Canada down to the states and breeding with Americans. We are we have, we have six become, billion letters in our genome. Pardon me. We have we have six billion letters in our genome. Three billion from mom. Three billion from dad. And would we and not expect that? 
would we not expect that over a long period of time or would we expect that over 4,400 years? That's my question. Here's the thing. Evolutionists like yourself assume that mutations are the source of all variety and they reject this idea of front loaded genetic variety. Okay. You're, you're saying that this is all just a big, long process of genetic mistakes. So you're, you're precluding the, you're not even considering the possibility that there was front loaded genetic variety and created DNA functional differences from the start. Like I said, this makes predictions on DNA function, DNA variety, mutation rates, speciation rates. Are you familiar because you're a big animal guy before this is over? Do you know how many bird species approximately there are on this planet right now? Tens of thousands. So I'm going to ask you a question no, right no, no. now. You're wrong. You're wrong. Just Google it. How many bird species? It says 10,000, but I'll give you about 12 to uh, 12 to 15,000. Okay. So if science tells us that there's only 10,000 bird species on the planet, we can actually make a prediction. And Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has made predictions. We see new species of finch right before our eyes. So that means if Noah brought even, let's say, 80 different bird kinds on the ark, okay, then there should be, based on empir the empirical method, mathematical calculation, there should be somewhere between this exact amount of bird species that we see today. These numbers line up exactly what, uh, with what is in line with young earth creation uh, speciation rates and the created heterozygosity hypothesis. I've got rates on lizards. There's about you know 4,600 lizard species. Uh, we can do birds, snakes. They all line up perfectly with um, all coming from ancestors on, on the ark. I, I can show you this. It, it works out perfectly, actually. It works out perfectly. Or so you are telling me right now, and please don't cut us off right now, James, that an emu and a hummingbird is the same kind. Is that what you're going to tell me? How many kinds did I just say as a working hypothesis, Mark? Noah you didn't even brought... say the word kind. You did not say the word kind. I'll give you credit for that. You haven't brought up the word kind yet. But... Well, the biblical view, Mark, would say that God created kinds, okay, which is more, let's say, the family level. What do we have? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Let, let, yes. Let's make a working hypothesis. Let, let, let's put the kind at, at the family level. Okay, Not species or genus, but family, okay? Noah Perfect. takes kinds onto the ark not species. So this means that there exists some limited speciation um, that can happen. So let's say Noah brought 80 different kinds of birds on the ark as a working hypothesis. Well, I just showed you the, the numbers. I've indicated that uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, a Harvard graduate, has made predictions on speciation rates. And if we take the calculations and take it right back to um, that based on speciation, let's say 3.3 3 .3, or more new bird species every single year based on the 10,000 we see today. That lines up We don't up see that perfectly. today. We don't see, we, uh, come on, standing. We don't see three new species a Mark, year. Yeah. Mark, we just seen the past year, there's a paper uh, published that a, 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 a breakaway population of finches, and you're talking about the finches earlier, they broke off. What they seen genetically was reductions in heterozygosity, shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity, and a new species was formed in our in the present, in our very eyes. I agree. I mean, according to evolution, I agree. This but how do we get years. how do we get from a penguin to a hummingbird? How do we do that? How how do we get from a penguin to a hummingbird? I'm not talking about a finch that is no longer uh, uh, genetically able to breed with another is a hummingbird finch. and a penguin related. How, how do we get to that point? How do we get to the point where we have these birds all the way from a, let's go from emu to penguin to hummingbird. H how do we get to that point? Okay. Are you saying that according to my model, a hummingbird, an emu, and a penguin are all related through common ancestry? Absolutely. How can they not be? They're all the bird Mark, kind. Mark. Okay, remember, according to my model, God created kinds of creatures. Okay, they're not species. They're not even the level, the, the level of genus. I'm saying as a working hypothesis, let's say the kind level. We've seen actually uh, DNA barcoding results recently that suggest that over 90 percent of the species today i'm sure you've seen that that article in that paper arose at the exact same time so there's your of course boundary. they did that's what we're saying of course they did we all came out of the ocean at the same time 
about 300 million years ago. Well, and this paper said 200,000 years ago they arose, though. How many years ago? Well, the paper says 200,000 years ago, but they're using, you know, um, they're using divergence and evolutionary based assumptions. The, diver the diversity suggests that they all arose or recently, 90% of species, but then they invoke, as usual, a population bottleneck for all the species at the same time. No, 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 no. Evolutionary bias is at work here. That sounds exactly like, like the flood. And as I said, with, um, in regards to speciation events, speciation um, rates, We've seen new new species of finches on the Galapagos Islands, okay, that people have been studying for, for years. So there's new species in observed time have been um, have been observed, okay. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has made predictions that according to the um, according to the biblical flood model, we should be seeing about anywhere between 2.5 and 4 species a year. If we look at the bird species that we see today, okay, let's say about 11,000, we factor that, there's about 4,500 years since the flood mark, and of course we see the species of bird came from the handful, I'm saying a handful of bird kinds on the ark, okay, could have been a penguin kind, could have been an emu kind, but the point is, all of it combined, 11,000 bird species divided by 4,500, it gives us two or three species per year, that's exactly what Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is predicting, and this is in print. These predictions are coming true. I, I know you scoff at the Bible and stuff, but genetically speaking, we have the evidence, Mark. We have the evidence. I don't scoff at the Bible. I look at the Bible as any other ancient text. There is nothing to back it, and I, I don't get mean to get disrespectful here, but there's nothing to back it. It's just a bunch of people say this, so it must be true. To be honest with you, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. If, if you just stop at the point that we are human beings and look at our bodies and ask yourself, and then we're going to cut it off. We're going to let James do his um, studying tonight. He's, he's <laughs> Sorry, going James, for his we're doctorate. just having too much fun. Yeah, so I'm going right, we'll to ask. We'll talk about this in person. I'm going to ask everybody to stop and look at their body right now. I'm going to ask you to look at your teeth. I'm going to ask you to look at your eyes. I'm going to ask you to look at your joints and ask yourself the way you are made. Could you live forever? The answer is no. Then I'm going to ask you to look at yourself. Could you last for 900 years or a thousand years? The answer is no. Your teeth would be gone at 100 years. Your eyes would no longer be able to focus at 100 years. And then ask yourself, what is the whole story about man living forever? If you look at the original Bible, and then I'm going to let you do a closing, okay? So just let me, let me say this, and then I'll let you do a closing, yeah, and then we'll go time. to question and answer. I'm going to ask you, to honestly, if there's any creationists out there, what is the Adam story all about? So God made Adam. Adam was showing a bunch of animals as a, I'm not going to say mate. I'm not going to go disrespectful here and say that God was going to jump on a sheep and have sex with it. But I don't know um, what else to say. But let's just say that, that Adam needed... Um, a companion, something to spend his day with. Does this story make sense to you? He's going to live forever. So at this point, God made the earth for only Adam to live forever with all of these animals. Now, let's say that Standing comes back and says, nope, that's not it. He always had the intentions of making a woman. Okay, so then she he brought eve on well first he brought lilith but then he brought eve let's say so were they designed to live forever and their offspring designed to live forever if that's the case we would be dealing with trillions of, of people by now this does not make sense and i will wrap it up at that point Awesome. Well, thank you um, for that, Mark. <clears throat> I'll make mine quick about probably the um, uh, same 
time frame is yours. Uh, with with speciation, as I indicated there, and I think as I demonstrated that the recent observations documented, they've documented the formation of, of the new species at rates much faster than, than predicted by evolution. But yet it's exactly in line with predictions that have been published uh, by creation scientists. So uh, the amount of species we see today based on the created heterozygosity hypothesis is, is exactly in line with the biblical based model. All of genetics, we can look at uh, the, the mitochondrial DNA, we can see that there's three major haplogroups that take us right back to Noah's three daughters-in-law. The creationists are the ones making the testable predictions. And the evolutionists need, need to step up. I didn't see any answer from uh, Mark regarding uh, functional endogenous retroviruses, orphan genes, these taxonomically uh, restricted and, and essential genes in our genome that point us right back to um, limited ancestry. I didn't see any answers to what type of selection can remove so many deleterious mutations that are pouring into into our genetics. Uh, his entire opening was based on an appeal to uh, majority, uh, probably more so an appeal to emotion. Uh, the one thing he did bring up was um, the uh, the rock record, for example, you know, he, I've seen him say it before, he said it now, I think this is the only thing that wasn't addressed. Important He'll say tweet here. Uh, this, how much, uh, just give me 20 seconds, James, and I'm done. Okay. Uh, you know, Mark says you got this type of fossil in this layer and then these types of fossils in, in these layers. He thinks that it goes from marine fossils to land fossils in the order of, of pond scum to people, uh, fish to fishermen evolution, but that's actually incorrect. And we've got marine fossils all the way through, even with dinosaur fossils, we've got marine fossils buried with them. So the fact is the order of the fossils that he points to is the burial order of the, of the flood. If the if the flood began in the ocean, okay, ripping up all those marine creatures and burying them on the continents, they would be the first creatures to be buried. And as the floodwaters rose higher, you get the burial of the land animals. And this is exactly um, what we find. So even even the um, the, the rock record uh, demonstrates biblical creation, burial by ecosystems, communities, oh, right. that's and habitats. So seconds. that's all I have to say, Mark. I had a lot of fun. Uh, that, did fly, that did fly by. And James, thanks for letting us uh, go on and on. Hope the audience had fun. Thanks. It's Make our... some money, James. Make some money. <laughs> it's our pleasure to host you guys. Thanks so much. <laughs> really fun. And there are a lot of super chats. We'll try to read through as many questions as we can. Thanks so much. I think we can get through these. Flying through, stupid whore energy strikes again. She Man. says, my corona, oh, you make my motor run, my motor run. Nasty lady, <laughs> very nasty, but I like her music. Uh, He's at it again. Steven Steen, thanks for your super chat, you sicko. He said, sorry, Mark. <laughs> Let's see. You're bald and pretty, but standing for truths, just smarter. Well, Good stop. Doesn't Mark? I always look at your picture. Hey, let's the, be nice. I always look at your picture in the uh, thumbnail, Mark, and I always think you look like an action hero. Folks, look <laughs> at the look at the thumbnail and tell me he doesn't look like like a like a perfect fit for an action hero. So, Stephen, he Steve, does look like he could play in the next Die Hard. Definitely, and Stephen. Steve, one year ago, one year about a year and a half ago, I used to have hair down to my ass, believe it or not, and I got sick of it and I shaved it all off. Well, the next time we have a debate, I'm going to post a picture. That's awesome, epic. You really should. We could put it in the thumbnail. Okay, next up, uh, Stephen Steen strikes again. Who says, "Congrats, standing for truth on your objectively easy win." Good stop. That's <laughs> yeah. Steven. He, he likes to stir up trouble, he's doesn't a, he? He's a very trollish man. Speed of uh, speed of sound <laughs> of gravity. Thanks for your super chat. Very generous. And they said, just for James, thank you. This is the last of my toilet paper fund. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Had to wipe with baby wipes this morning. Next up, Florida man. Thanks for your super chat. They said, don't smoke crack, kids. Well, I agree. Pax Americana. Thanks for your super chat. They said... Tell Mark to stick to biology and not politics. LOL. There you go. Oh, Mark, how do you like them apples? Trump lover. That, Mark? We got a Trump guy out there. Gotcha. We might. It could be. All right. Thanks so much for your super Love chat. From, let's see. Steven Steen again. Boy, nasty guy. Says Trump was voted in because of racism, not young earth creationism. Duh, in all caps. Ooh, sassy, nope. Steven. 
Next up, Pax Americana, thanks for your super chat. They said, ask Stanley for truth where he got his degree in biology from. Harvard University. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much. Me and Mark much. went to separate schools together. <laughs> we were in the same class together. We both went to Harvard. Very nice. Appreciate that. Legally Blonde style, yeah. Very, very nice. That's I've never seen Legally Blonde. Was that her Harvard? I think that was Harvard. Yeah, that yeah, was actually. Harvard. Oh. How'd she get in again? Was yeah, was I totally. Movie. Maybe my wife and I will watch it tonight. Oh man, I would. I could watch it tonight. I have a huge. Really blonde tonight, honey. Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> Next up, Stephen Steen. Thanks for your super chat. He said, "COVID didn't evolve. It just chose humans over bats." Huh? I don't know. Yeah, I mean the virus um, cross species. Our immune systems can't can't recognize it. It's it's burning hot and fast. It's it's not good. It's not good at all. So I'm, I'm with Mark on that. It's um, I, I hope everyone's doing well uh, regarding it, but it's it's some crazy times. Gotcha. And thanks so much for your super chat from Robert Summers, who asks, what exact viruses is Standing for Truth talking about? This is earlier on in the debate. My guess is it might have been around when you were talking about viruses that just regularly live in the human body. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, like the, the the many viruses, I mean, trillions of viruses that, that exist in the human body. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's just redundant. I, Mark and I talked about this for a while, but they help control the number of, of bacteria um, and, and actually may even kill bacteria that would in turn make us sick. So it's good for our bodies and it's good for it's, it's good for the ecosystem. ERVs are functional to our genetics as well. So, um, yeah, good question. Gotcha. Thanks so much for your response from Sandy for truth and also thanks for stupid whore energy for your super chat it says james's green screen is rather sophisticated sophisticated it went from dusk to night yes isn't it special this is our first sunset together everybody i don't know if you if you click if you go click earlier in the stream and you'll see it was like daylight it's kind of neat to look at that sigifredo sarabia thanks for your super chat sigifredo in the house from los angeles says Standing for truth, did Eve, if not birthed, have a belly button? Yeah, no, I, I would say Adam and Eve being created directly from God would not have had, obviously Eve from, uh, from Adam's rib would not have had a belly button. That would have been um, Adam and Eve's kids and um, all the way back to us, which like I said, many times we can use genetics to trace us right back to Adam and Eve. That's what the genetics tells us. The genetic stru structure of of us, of Mark, of James, all screams out Adam and Eve. But yeah, probably no no belly button would make sense. Gotcha, thanks so much. Next up, appreciate your super chat from Stagnu Demort A. Eh? By the way, hold on, just really quick. I have to say this because I'm pumped, I'm excited, and I feel like I haven't given enough like shout outs. We had two new patrons in the last, I think it was like the last 24 hours, which is awesome, Darren DeVillier, let me know if I mispronounce your name, anybody. And Duranku, very excited to have you as Patreon patrons. Thanks so much for joining with us. And want to let you know, folks, we do have those patron settings. I'm actually, give me, like, let me know. I have no idea how to run a patron. I'm like working on it. And so, you know, we had like the Patreon priority question and stuff like that. So anyway, check it out if you guys might dig it. But want to say thanks and welcome to those new patrons. Also, thanks so much from Stagnu de Morte. Now I'm gonna read that. So their question was, why would viruses have to affect the germline if the viruses would have to be introduced in vitro? The mother could pass it on without that change. So germline mutations are what are passed on. And if there is an ancient viral infection in our germline, well, then it would be hypothetically um, passed on. Is she saying that viruses will be passed on through the um, in vitro through well, in the somatic cell lines? Um, I'd probably need more detail on that. That's super interesting and appreciate your super chat from stupid beta energy. I mean, stupid whore energy. She says, <laughs> standing for truth. Why do dolphins have genes for legs? Why do humans still have yolk producing genes? 
Right, so those yolk produced genes are based on fragments. Um, there's some papers and articles you can look at it. It all comes down to the junk DNA paradigm, uh, pseudo genes, which they say are genetic mistakes. These are not genetic mistakes. These are actually functional DNA elements. And, and we've seen the overturning of the so-called egg yolk pseudo gene. Um, a lot of these you know, so-called genetic mistakes are actually just functional DNA differences, respective to the different species and the uh, different kinds. And, and that's a direct prediction based on our uh, created genetic diversity hypothesis that I, that I touched on, that the vast majority of our um, genetics uh, will be functional. And, and that's exactly what we're, um, we're seeing. So whoever asked that question, yeah, definitely uh, they're behind on, on the science, unfortunately, but I can, I can direct them uh, you know, to the right path. Gotcha. So can I just, just ask you a quick question? Standing is science going towards that we evolved from six people 4,000 years ago? Yeah, good question. So for example, um, we're making uh, testable predictions on mitochondrial DNA variants. So we can see that in the world, our um, mitochondrial DNA, we, we go back to three major haplogroups. So you can make predictions based on that. For example, the L node, and you can see that those haplogroups are directly in line with Noah's three daughters-in-law. So yeah, that's exactly uh, what I'm saying. And we can see that with the pseudo genes. We can see even the chromosomal two fusion. I mean, all these things have been overturned. And I think there's a lot of evolutionists that are just behind the times because genetics is evolving more and more every day. So our our fusion of, of chromosome two and three is proving that we came from a common ancestor 4,400 years ago? Good question. No, yeah, the uh, hypothetical uh, chromosomal two fusion, it's, it's been overturned because for one, there, there's it, it's really hard to find these so-called remnant telomeres. The area is highly, highly degenerate, as well as the um, so-called remnant or cryptic centromere that should be uh, that, sh that should be found. They're having a difficult time finding that. And um, the fusion sites actually located, Mark, you may, you may be aware of this, the hypothetical fusion sites located smack dab in the middle of a complex and functional gene. Um, but it, its sequence contains a functional transcription factor binding domain that's, believe it or not, uniquely positioned to control the transcriptional complexity of that DDX 11L2 gene. So there's many different factors at play that have overturned the chromosomal two fusion it's not it's not a fusion site well it gotcha. hasn't been overturned we've gotta, we've gotta but it hasn't track. been overturned but it's definitely a unique site the two and three geno uh, i think you will agree that um there's definitely something there we need to look at that that genome does not look right to us and there's a reason that two and three do not look right yeah, there looks to be some degeneration. Standing, maybe a quick response, there. but then we got to jump right back into the Q and A. Standing. Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just saying there. Um, there's some degeneration um, going on on there. Gotcha. De that's all I got to say. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to rush you, but Tioga in the live chat, by the way, said standing for truth is the smartest scientist in the world. You got a fan out there standing for truth. <laughs> that is the nicest thing I've ever heard. Yes. I, I, nice. I paid that person to say it. So uh, let's see, but thank you very much for that. Next up, <laughs> Tioga, you said it, you can't take it back. Next up, appreciate your super chat from, let's see, this is Sigifredo Sarabia in the house. Says, Woo! Mark, would you describe a lion as, quote, designed to hunt or jump? What's the cause of, quote, design in animals using, quote, unintelligible or, quote, random events in nature? Yeah, that's a lot of quotes. So <laughs> what it really comes down to is survival. A, a lion and a tiger is designed to survive in its um, environment. So if you look at a lion, a lion is designed to uh, blend in to the environment that it lives in. So it lives in the savanna. You look at a lion, absolutely looks like tall grass. The, the colors match perfectly. 
You look at a tiger, which is part of the uh, panther family. Um, it looks exactly like the environment that it lives in. As a matter of fact, you look at both of them in the environment that they live in and you cannot see them from the background. Um, they're very well hidden. So th there's a good example of speciation. You look at a tiger, lives in Asia. You look at a uh, lion, lives in Africa yet they can breed together. So there's a really good example of speciation um, moving to new geographic areas and then producing new offspring and adapting to their environment. Gotcha. Yeah. Mike uh, Billard. Just, I just, have just, just a tiny, like, tiny response. Super short and pithy. So I, I would say that the, the cat species, the cat family, uh, goes perfectly well with, with the biblical base model. For example, the cat ancestor aboard the ark, which we were talking about earlier, if, if the cat ancestor, ancestor was front loaded with a whole bunch of functional DNA differences and with those has led to the origin of species, well, what other ways can we determine ancestry other than bleeding? Well, other than breeding, as uh, Mark talked about. So if you use the cats as a basic example, Noah brings aboard two cats, and now we have everything from tigers to house cats to jaguars and in between. And then, like I said, we can look at function and other uh, methods to determine kind boundaries and things like that. So that's a good gotcha. example. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, and just let me, uh, 10 seconds, if standing <laughs> is right, if standing is right, James, we have no worries about animals going extinct. We can take our two house cats and we can produce tigers. We can produce snow leopards and we will be able to produce lions. But we all know we cannot do that. We but can, can, but do the for house truth, cats have enough heterozygosity to do so? We can do, do, a, round do, a, round do so. a round two standing for truth. Uh, <laughs> Mike Billars, thanks for your super chat. They said, if God wanted us to see the evidence for him, as you mentioned, why not just come out and tell us instead of playing hide and seek with vague hints? Standing for truth, I, I, think wouldn't, I wouldn't say it, it's vague hint. I mean, the complexity of of our genome, for example, just screams a designer. I mean, we have uh, our, our genome is, is multi-layered. It's multifunctional. Um, the design in, in animals, in nature, for example, the evidence from even the first and second law of thermodynamics and genetic entropy that takes us back to a point of least increasing entropy in the universe and in our genetics. That's a point of creation. And God doesn't need to give us all this scientific based evidence. I mean, you know, we're, we're saved by faith through grace, of course, but he's given us so much scientific evidence to show that he exists, to, sh to show that, that he's there. So uh, just like the Bible says, I mean, a lot of people are, are willingly ignorant um, in, in that they're without excuse, but the evidence is there. It, it really is. Next up, appreciate your super chat from Philip. Thanks for your, they said, Philip, uh, standing for truth, how did you determine that we came from Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago using genetics? If you need, can you cite a source for this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got a ton of sources. I've got sources for everything that I've um, talked about here. Sounds redundant to go over it um, again, but it's just in our mitochondrial DNA, in our uh, Y chromosome DNA as well, based on the empirical method, based on pedigree studies, um, the mutation rates. Uh, we can make calculations that actually take us right back to 6,000 years ago uh, to the common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve and uh, Y chromosome Adam. Those aren't the only factors, but I'm not going to go on and on. And, and gotcha. Q&A, just rewatch the debate. Thanks, Up. Uh, thanks so much for your super chat from SJ Thomason. She is in the house. Dr. Thomason says, Mark, if you saw, quote, I love you, unquote, written on the beach, would you assume a mind wrote that? Our DNA consists of 3.5 billion ordered, quote, letters. How can you claim we aren't designed? Well, we're not designed because we, we line up so well with the animal kingdom. Um, I, I know what they're saying, and I honestly do feel for the people that don't understand science, but we, we line up with the animal kingdom perfectly. We have babies that sometimes are born with tails, fully functioning tails, and that is unexplainable. And I know that the young earth creationists like to 
put aside Hankel's drawings as being fraudulent, but they're not. They were they were definitely on the let's say plus ten scale of being um, looking for an answer towards um, evolution, but we do go through stages. We, we see chickens in their um, embryonical stages born with, chi- with, with uh, uh, teeth. We see this, these things going on. There's a lot of things that tell us that we are definitely um, inter- interlinked with other animals very closely and all animals are linked to us. A uh, real quick response, James. Yeah, as I indicated earlier, you know, the nested hierarchical patterns that we see in life, it's it's also predicted by um, the design model. I mean, the hierarchies we see is just a uh, reflection of, of God's hierarchical nature. So we need differentiating evidence to uh, determine which model is true, universal ancestry or limited ancestry. And yeah, the, the genome that we, we've got layer upon layer of, of programming within the genome and programming requires a programmer. So I just wish that Mark would look at the evidence more objectively. And I think he would, um, he'd, he'd come to a Next far up. different Next conclusion up. than he has. Next up. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt you, but you are a man of many words sometimes, standing <laughs> Thank you very much. Stupid whore energy strikes again and says oh, letters. No. She says letters don't have affinities like amino acids do, but ironically, language evolves. That was in response to SJ's, who I just read right before. SJ Thomason strikes again. She says, Mark, do animals have the capacity to reason, apprehend beauty, explain abstract concepts or plan for their distant futures yes absolutely they do if you look at the more intelligent animals like um uh take elephants for example every year on their migration they stop and they um respect their dead they do like we do where they return to the grave and they will stand there and they will have moments of um, uh, in movement. We've watched them. Um, yes, absolutely. Do not, do not, please do not underestimate the, the compassion of animals. I think even Standing for Truth will back me on this. Our animal, um, uh, the animals we live with are very compassionate and they will um, respect their their dead. That, you know, you got dolphins. There's a lot of examples of this. Animals are very compassionate. And anyone with a dog um, would never ask that question, whether or not an animal can, uh, can become um, almost human in emotion. Gotcha. Thanks so much, folks. We do have several questions that I got, standard questions that were asked earlier in the debate. So call me emo. Thanks for your question. Said, standing for truth, keep this short, standing for truth. Said, how can we (laughs) empirically assess the limits of a heterozygosity and how can we identify the descendants of an original design? E.g., are all crustaceans related? Uh. I'll use just a few words, James. Um, easy, uh, we see limitations in, in all species. We see limitations in, in genetics. Just like you can't get a dog the size of a blue whale or a dog the size of a flea, there exists l- limitations. And if Adam and Eve were created with this, originally created heterozygosity or the animal kinds had these um, you know, front-loaded DNA differences, if new species are formed, from shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity, that means there will be limits in allelic potential and allelic variability. So um, it's, it's, it's quite an easy answer, to be honest with you. Gotcha. Thank you very much, Standing for Truth. And Clone, thanks for your question. I saw you're still in the live chat. Stoked you've been here a good almost two hours. They asked, question for Standing for Truth, isn't the Adam and Eve he's talking about Ooh, uh, let's see. Didn't, oh, I'm sorry about that. My fault. They said, didn't the Adam and Eve that Standing for Truth is talking about live hundreds of thousands of years ago? Are these the same people in the Bible? 
Right. Very good point. So I actually addressed that directly in the um, in the discussion. So <clears throat> when we use, you know, empirically observed mutation rates for mitochondrial DNA or studies in the Y chromosome, um, the empirical method tells us that these ancestors lived recently, just thousands of years ago. But when evolutionists do the same studies and analyses, they don't use the empirical method. They don't use observe mutation rates, they use hypothetical mutation rates that are um, 10 to 20 fold lower than what's actually observed. So they, they add in evolutionary based assumptions to come up with their, their date. Gosh, yeah, thanks so much. Let's see. I don't suppose you can hear that person arguing in the background. There's like a somebody outside yelling pretty loud, but can you, you can't hear them. Okay, good. That's embarrassing. Are they arguing about the debate? Yes, they are. They're arguing about biblical ancestry. So let's, let's see. <laughs> Thanks for your uh, question from Praise I Am. That's been totally debunked. Okay, thanks. For, he says, <laughs> my question, love you, praise. My question to Mark is, can you name any scientists outside the National Academy of Science who subscribes to evolution? And Take your time, Mark. I got to run upstairs real quick. He says, yeah, I, National Academy of Science equals atheist stronghold. No, I, I really got to tell you, there's no conspiracy on this side. We don't get a weekly newsletter on how we're going to overthrow God. Um, I, I, I'm telling you from this side, as an engineer, as a person who follows science, we, there is no conspiracy. There is no weekly newsletter that goes out. We will follow the evidence wherever it goes. And I understand what Standing for Truth is saying. Um, I actually really enjoy um, debating him. He, he's, a, he's a great guy, very honest, he's very polite. So, um, but yeah, there, there is no conspiracy here. We just follow the evidence wherever it leads us. And that's, that's really all there is to it. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And I want to let you know, folks, really excited. Tomorrow it'll be, I decided I was like, I was going to re release this earlier this month, but I was like, oh, it'd be fun if I did it like the exact date six years after it happened. So tomorrow I will be releasing one of my old debates that was in person in Mankato, Minnesota. So highly encourage you to check that out. It's, uh, my hair is embarrassing, but you, you know, you'll see. So that will be posted tomorrow around noon, Eastern Standard Time. And also though, very excited about another debate. This one will not be from the past. This one is from the, pu the future. It is on April 6th, and that's going to be G-Man and Erica. It's April 4th or 6th, we're figuring it out, on intelligent design. So that should be a lot of fun, folks. And last question that I've got here, last one we can take, sorry folks. Uh, question for Mark. It's a cheeky one for you, Mark. It's from Mitchell. And um, let's see. <laughs> Mitchell says for Mark, when will COVID-19 evolve into a fish? LOL. That sounds like something. <laughs> I think we know whose joke that sounds like, but I'll give you a chance to respond, Mark. Yeah, we'll take this slightly seriously. So uh, viruses are not considered living um, organisms like we consider, say, a fish. Um, they're, they're not living. They're missing a lot of the um, parameters that we put on what we consider a living organism. So no, it, it's not going to evolve. But what it's going to do is we're all going to become immune to this. We're all going to go through it. We're all going to run this through our system. We're going to build up an immunity to it. And just like influenza, influenza next year, it's going to come back. It's going to come back in two years and it's going to have mutated and we're not going to have an immunity to it and we're going to go through it again. And that's our concern. Gotcha. Thanks so much, Mark. And yes, isn't it? It's just a strange time. It's never been stranger. I've never lived through anything like this. Mark, have you, have you ever like seen anything like this? I, I don't think you, I, I would doubt you have. No, I've never seen, I'm 52 years old. This is really strange times. So what I can say to people is 
this is not going to be over real soon. Um, I, I do follow science. I follow biology. I follow uh, medical, um, the understandings of the, the, the medical society. And we're not about to get over this. We've got to get the top of the bell curve. And until we do, things are going to get really scary. We need to take this very seriously and we need to stomp it out. And we're not going to do it as uh, President Trump says, by going to church on Easter. Um, things are gonna change. You've got a serious next three, four months of life ahead of you, and it's gonna change. We got a lot of debates coming up because we're all gonna be sitting on our couch. So let's, <laughs> let's fuck Give them up. Give us something to do. It's fun. It really is fun to be here with you guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we were hoping to do some touring in April, but we have already called it off. And yeah, we uh, it might be, who knows how long it'll be. But you know, the nice thing is, like Mark said, we can always do it from our living room. So it is always fun. You know, I, I just really do enjoy this, folks. Really glad you hang out with us. I have to say a huge thank you to the speakers tonight. The debaters are the lifeblood of the channel, folks. I mean, they make it fun. And so I am indebted to them i can't say thanks enough both for just getting to listen but also that it's just a you know it, it kind of it brings all these people together and so we do hope you know whether you are christian atheist as we always say republican democrat jedi or even sith we hope you feel welcome we're a nonpartisan channel and hopefully you know you can kind of feel like uh even though there's debating and all that good stuff hopefully you do feel welcome though and so yeah last uh anything in terms of goodbye, Standing for Truth and Mark, thanks so much, both of you. Did yeah, you how about you give us one minute, um, free range to say goodbye. Um, who would go first based on who opened? Uh, I guess I open so I can, um, I'll, I'll make it really, really quick. Actually, James, okay. did you? Because I know I left for a minute there. Because um, I know Rob, Adam, myself have a debate we're looking forward to on Sunday with zoologist Adam Heap. Did you? I know you advertise a couple debates there. You're right about that. Uh, Standing for Truth will be back with his twin brother, Raw Matt. That's right. <laughs> the one that Mark has uh, correctly, before the debate, asked, who's the guy who dresses like an Egyptian god? Well, uh, yes, that's Matt. good old Raw Matt will be here. And that's with Steam Driven. That will be a trifecto debate. So that's going to be a fun one. And uh, Steam Driven is an, I think it's a zoologist, if I remember right. Is it zoologist or animal specialist? He's a zoologist and herpetologist. Gotcha. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And looking forward to that one this Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard. Hopefully we'll get to hang out with you then, folks. And then I know that tomorrow, other than the one, like I said, I'll release one at 12 that's not live. I will see you on Friday probably because we, we likely will have Flat Earth this Friday. That's still kind of re-piecing itself back together saturday flat though, earth oh, are yeah. you serious yes that's right uh once you go flat you never go back and then saturday <laughs> we, are, we are going to have, <laughs> oh we'll get we'll change your mind mark uh let's see i'm not really a flat earther that's a joke but uh saturday we'll have a, a tag team on god's existence that's going to be amy if i remember right it's amy newman Amy, I saw you in the live. Yeah, Amy Newman is in the live chat right now. She'll be here with Tom Jump. They are doing a tag team match against Sterling and Canadian Catholic. Those Canadians, we got them all over the place. So that'll be a lot of fun. So thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we'll we'll do that uh, one minute from each of you. So standing for truth, if you want to go first, the floor is all yours. Yeah, make it quick. Uh, thanks to Mark for doing this debate. I had a lot of fun. The back and forth was. Um, hopefully enjoyable by the live audience. I'd love to do another one at some point in the future. I enjoy talking to you, Mark, so I, I appreciate you doing this. And James, once again, thanks so much for setting it up. Love your channel. Um, always gives us something to look forward to, especially in these times. So, um, yeah, well, all I have to say is thanks so much, guys, and I had a good time. Thank you. Mark, the floor is all yours. The floor, eh? Thank you so much, Standing. I, I actually really enjoyed this uh, talk with you. 
Uh, I'm going to continue on talking with you. I, I am not a professional debater by any stretch of the imagination. I know a lot of people um, look at me as a person that has debated Kent in the past. Um, I want to go on record tonight as saying that I will no longer be debating Kent Holman. I will not be talking to him in the future. I will not have any um, anything going on with Kent at all. He had a, a child of seven years old uh, die on his property, and I thought the way that he... Um, addressed it was absolutely disgusting so i will no longer be talking to kent hoven in any aspect whatsoever i'm not beating up on him because he's not here for himself i'm just stating unless he apologizes for the way that he um addressed this seven-year-old boy that drowned on his property i will no longer speak to that man i really enjoyed tonight i hope you can book us in again within the next week or so we're all sitting on our couch and our jammies so we might as well do this all i did was put on a sweater so that i looked like i was dressed and showered but we're all sitting around doing nothing let's let's book another um time for standing for us to uh to get together but yes i will no longer be speaking to kent in any aspect from now on whatsoever james gotcha and uh mark is totally serious he did only throw on a sweater when he stood up, he had no pants on. Uh, just disgrace. Oh, no, please. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, standing for truth, the floor is all yours. No, I, I already gave my, uh, my goodbyes. Like I said, thanks, Mark. Uh, James, you're on the ball today. You know what? You could, if, if I'm down, I come to you because you can always make me laugh. Thank you, Standing. It's always fun. We appreciate you guys being here uh, everybody out there in the live chat, thanks so much for making this fun as well. Want to encourage you, I put both these guys' links in the description, so check them out, folks. And thanks so much for hanging out here. Love you guys. Hope you have a great and healthy, you know, enjoyable rest of your Wednesday or Thursday, depending on where you are. So talk to you soon and have a great night, everybody. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.